Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leonard Waverman. I'm pleasure of being the Dean of the Degree School of Business. And thank you all for joining us today for uh, the Knowledge Lab Labs webinar uh, hosted by us. And uh, in partnership with Raymond James, we thank them for their on continuing support uh, in various programming that we do and this Knowledge, knowledge Labs series. I'd like to thank our unsung behind the scenes team, uh, Kelly Rayback, the manager, Leah Fleet, and Olivia Stankovic for uh, all they do. Uh, hosting everything we do takes a lot of time and they deserve a huge amount of credit for the way they're supporting the school through this period of time. So, and, and we're also thankful for our faculty, our alumni and friends with the, who have the depth of research and knowledge in, in the vital in the issues and industries that are uh, at the root of, of where we want to go forward. Because uh, what we're doing at this point is trying to support uh, people in, uh, in industry and nonprofits in thinking through uh, what, is, you, what do you do now during the pandemic? What can you do afterwards? And we're using a variety of channels, uh, web articles, webinars, and we have an in the know video playlist as well. And I'm pleased to share uh, one thing now, one thing at the end. Uh, we've started an Ask the Expert uh, partnership with the uh, Hamilton Chamber of Commerce and the Burlington Chamber of Commerce, where we had a webinar with each of them. And th these webinars are to support local, small, and medium sized businesses uh, in terms of uh, how they can deal with this uh, unforeseen for all of us, very uncertain world that we're in. And so uh, uh, faculty members uh, such as Benson, who you'll be seeing today, who's the moderator, uh, have offering their time freely to local businesses. And so uh, if you're interested in this, there's the website where you can come in and post a question and a faculty member will get back to you with some uh, how we can help out. Now let, let me introduce our, our two uh, panelists for today. We have uh, Adam Fileski, who's kindly agreed to participate in this discussion. He's the CEO and co-founder of Portage 3 Ventures, which is a leading fintech company, one of the leaders in the world, over 700 million in assets under management. Uh, they made 35 investments so far in fintech in eight different countries. Uh, prior to this, uh, Adam founded was CEO of Horizons Exchange Traded Funds, a director and founder, founding investor of Beta Shares Exchange Traded Funds in Australia. Uh, these business, this business was sold to Mireille Asset Management of Korea. Uh, we're proud to call Adam one of our own. He graduated with a degree in Bachelor of Engineering and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science in 1999. He's a very strong friend of the school. He is someone I rely on for advice, uh, which he's unafraid to offer. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, Adam funds our, our best, uh, biggest MBA scholarship and our annual Insight uh, Lecture Series. So Adam, thank you very much for being here. And the moderator for today, Vincent Honig, who is the uh, Teresa Casioli Chair in Entrepreneurial Leadership at the Groot. He studies entrepreneurship worldwide, besides being an entrepreneur himself. His research interests include business planning, nascent entrepreneurship, transnational entrepreneurship, ethics and scholarship, social entrepreneurship, social capital, and entrepreneurship and elements of transition, certainly something we're going through today. He's published widely in leading academic journals and the media and serves on six editorial boards, I don't know where he finds the time, including the Journal of Business Venturing and the Journal of Management Studies, which are very high ranking uh, journals. So thank you, Benson, for joining us today. today. And I now turn it over to you. It's just uh, for the audience, a few things before we get started. There will be a question and answer period at the end uh, for Adam. So we encourage you to have those questions and send them in through the chat box and uh, we'll take care of them as many as we can afterwards. 
as well, uh, you should note this event is being recorded. So it might be used for promotional purposes or shared with, uh, with the group or with their students or participants. So by participating, um, you could do consent to being captured on video in your audio recordings. If you prefer not to have your video audio captured, please don't participate. And uh, the moderator can explore any, you getting any material if that's a problem, or you can contact our marketing department if you have any particular questions. Uh, finally, uh, we're hoping to get your feedback today. So at the end, you'll get an email. We really look forward to getting that feedback because we're trying to provide some important information to the community and your input regarding how well we're doing will help us improve that activity. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, so with that, um, I'm going to uh, ask some questions and uh, look for Adam's response. And we're really excited to have him on board because he's, He's uh, such a vibrant, knowledgeable person in the industry. So the first question I'll ask you, Adam, is more of a general one. And it has to do with the impact of COVID on uh, various industries, both now and in the immediate future. Let's say, let's say we pushed it out for one to two years. What, what do you think, and that's before we talk about venture capital, what do you think are, are the general impacts that we would expect to see in the economy in the next one or two years? Well, first and foremost, th thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to give back to McMaster and, and, and um, always appreci appreciate Len's support and being the driving force of DeGroote's. Um, the other comment I should say is looking at my picture in the opening deck piece, it looks like I should update uh, my look because uh, I think I've lost hair and age considerably post-crisis. Um, look, I think, I think in terms of your opening question, what has changed? What, if, what are the immediate impacts? And then longer term, what are people thinking about? I think that the first message that I would state and, and probably um, – is is not really taking a big leap is that from our firm's perspective we are in absolute observe observation mode assessment mode we're trying to understand what is, what are the changing behaviors through data i think there's a lot of great uh theses out there hypothesis of how behavior is going to change some indications how it has changed specifically because of uh, the quarantine, forced quarantine. But I don't think that necessarily is representative of the future. Um, I think there's no question that the, the crisis will impact the way the world works, the, the way we live, the way we, we vacation, but I don't think the data is sufficient today to, to make any huge conclusion. So that, that would be the, the opening comment. Um, in terms of the immediate things that we're seeing, I think that they're, they're the things that most people could observe quite quickly. Obviously, no one's traveling, uh, no one's commuting, uh, no one's at restaurants, no one's going to cinemas. Um, and therefore, effectively, you're seeing actually one of the fastest increase in savings for those that have been able to retain their employment than we've ever seen. Um, so I'd say those are, you know, that is sort of the quick observation that it would have in terms of people's activity. As a result of that, you, you know, we're seeing huge spikes, particularly as, as it relates to our industry into people using everything digital. So digital spend on, on the Amazons is, is 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 unbelievable paypal's business the fastest growing segment uh right now are, are people over the age of 50 um we are we we are seeing incredible amount of of upticks in people using services such as headspace around mental health issues we have a portfolio company in telemedicine that is extremely um helpful in 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 this environment 
So I'd say those are the kind of the short term spikes uh, that we're, we're seeing cash. Ca cash has decreased in, in a huge way. No, everyone's transacting digitally now. Um, but these are short term consequences of the current situation. I think I can speculate and give you a couple themes that we're thinking about. But again, we want data to, to reinforce whether uh, we are correct or not. I think one is we're really interested. Everyone says globalization's dead. We think interestingly, we may finally see the globalization of workforce. And so if we think about one of the benefits of this working at home environment is, um, you know, we are quite productive and in some cases more productive than we were because we're not, particularly if you live in Toronto or New York or, or other places with a lot of congestion, you, you know, you're taking two hours off people's commutes. Um, that's opening people to the idea that, you know, remote, remote working can work, can be more pr product of, uh, productive. And so I think pe people are going to be much more open to distributed teams and distributed teams, not just localized, not just domestically within a country, but, but globally. And, we're starting to already see that adoption. Uh, you know, Eastern European blocks, particularly around technology, I think are gonna be uh, huge benefactors uh, uh, of that theme. So that's, that's something that, that's very interesting to us and, and uh, ha has a lot of um, related echo effects. The second theme we're thinking about is really, and this has been a theme for some time, but it's going to, we believe it's gonna be accelerated is that there's going to be a really uh, a need for incumbent large institutions that use intermediaries to go direct. And I think they've been hesitant to go direct uh, because they uh, believe that a lot of their distributions is built upon and dependent upon those intermediaries. I think this crisis is showing that you can build personal direct relationships digitally. And so I think uh, those direct channels is gonna be a, a huge a huge investment for, for financial institutions and other uh, businesses uh, around the world. And then I think the other thing that we're thinking a lot about is the re-empowerment of in individuals and small businesses in particular. And I think Shopify, which should be you know, could be one of the, the all time amazing Canadian stories is, is in the platform business. And what's beautiful about their business is it's capital light. They're not spending dollars on distribution and marketing and advertising and trying to attract customers. Customers are finding them building on top, top of their platform, leveraging other services that have been built on their platform and they're just the infrastructure. So the infrastructure of everything, uh, the SaaS of everything is something and a theme that we're, we're really excited about and think that this environment will be a tailwind for that. Great, thanks, thanks for that. Um, so for my next uh, question, you know, we know that uh, disruptions and recessions uh, can cause all kinds of changes. A lot of very successful firms have come out of deep recessions, even depressions. Disney, GM, HP, Microsoft, all of them were launched during heavy recession, recessionary times. So um, given this is COVID and you know, the, the environment is looking very much recession-like or worse, how do you see the VC community leveraging the opportunity angle provided by COVID-19? And I, I'd add a couple other names that the more tech centric, like Instagram and Uber, Square, sure. Slack, um, sure. all of those st started post the last crisis. Um, one one thing that's interesting about the VC market in particular, and I just distinguish the private market in two two sort of buckets. There's growth and VC money that are willing to take more risk. There's traditional P that is more financially engineered. Um, what's interesting about this crisis, it's actually the, the less risk, um, more mature 
platforms or asset managers that are in more trouble. And it's because they were taking traditional businesses and, and then applying significant amount of leverage onto those businesses. Whereas ourselves, VC and growth, we're just dreamers and no one would ever lend it to us. And so a lot of our companies actually, um, you know, are well capitalized because they yeah, not only were we seeing record uh, fund growth uh, in the last five years, but then those underlying portfolio companies in turn have been very successful in raising capital. And just to give you some context on this, even today there's 200 billion in the United States alone on the sidelines just dedicated to VC. So I think uh, the VC market has a ton of liquidity and has the opportunity in the balance sheet to really go after what they think are the emerging theses that come out of this 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 crisis. So I think that that that's very different than the last crisis. So while there was great success as the last crisis, I would say it's going to be um, infinitely more just because of the amount of liquidity that will get behind these 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 companies. Um, so. You know, again, I think we are very specific. We look at financial services. Um, I do get a more generalist purview in, in everything we do. But I think one lesson that we learned, the market learned pre-COVID, which is tr even more true today, we saw in the fall with the collapse of WeWork. And, and I think what happened in our market a little bit was we – we got attracted to top line growth just for the purposes of growth and people forgot about the importance of gross margins as well as uh, something called operating margins. I don't think I'd heard the word operating margin in the last five years. So I think there's going to be a refocus on capital light businesses. Um, those that, you know, within a defined period, I would say five to eight years, can can demonstrate uh, massive margin expansion and and bottom bottom line cash flow. Those are the ones that are going to attract um, the most capital, and, and that's you know part of our 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 excitement and thesis around sort of infrastructure and the platforming of everything is you know that's an area we think is is less capital intensive and you know, there'll be a proliferation of potential users that are going to discover those, those pieces of infrastructure. Interesting. Well, cash is certainly king. And when things get difficult, you want to be, you want to be sitting on a pile of cash. So uh, another question I had was on a lot of the recent VC plays that we've seen uh, involving the shared economy. So the high growth area has been, you know, the tourism, transportation, Uber, uh, um, Airbnb, those sorts of things. So how do you see those investments weathering COVID-19? And do you see the VC community moving in a different direction or tangential direction to, to accommodate those changes? So I would go back to my first comment. It's tough to say. Um, you know, I... I've heard very good arguments why uh, the Ubers and Lyfts, as an example, long-term are gonna be huge benefactors of this crisis. Um, you know, fr from you know, adding, um, curing to their services and delivering packages to just the fact that people don't wanna take public transportation for some time. Um, I think tourism is, is, is one that everyone's going to be careful about. That said, actually, if you go back to using the 08 crisis again as a backdrop and lessons learned, you know, Expedia built their business on the back of, um, you know, entering into long-term contracts with some of their service providers that were desperate to survive. So I think, you know, most of us think in the t in time frames of seven to 10 years. And if there's a market leader that, um, is experienced serious challenges, but we believe their business model will return when things return to normal. It's actually a time where they will be successful in raising a lot of capital to go after either consolidation or again, 
uh, further embedding their services or their commercial advantages with, with those that aren't in, in as good of positions. Interesting. So I uh, now I'm thinking a little bit about how unpredictable this pandemic is or things like a pandemic. And I'm curious about how you as a VC invest. So, you know, there's a lot of debate whether um, the most important thing is the idea or the quality of the team, or some even think it might be a quality of the business plan. So I'm wondering how you view those, the balance of those three inputs and has the COVID-19 changed in any way how you prioritize how you evaluate a business opportunity? So we have a, we have a, it's a good question. We have a thesis driven approach. So every year uh, we, we revisit and develop our, our, our theses, which are based on kind of where we think uh, the world's going in a specific industry or what are key themes that, that we should be mindful of. And then with those theses, we then look to the market, trying to do a market map scan, identify companies that, are, that meet those theses and then are actively pursuing them. We do not, and I would say majority of VCs, I hope, um, really don't uh, wait for the phone to ring and, and take a, a random uh, walk approach. Um, and sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> is the dog barking? <laughs> Live TV. Um, so, so, so I guess post crisis, we sat as a team and we revisited all our theses and then revised some of our theses based on some speculation on and what the future could look like. Um, and then proactively go out searching, searching for a solution that, that meet that. So number one thesis Two, um, we actually, and it's tied is there's a, there's a thesis. And then what we want to identify is companies that really understand a specific pain point. So they've have a personal experience. Um, they've been at a company that's gone through something, but they've identified a real issue that they're frankly emotional about solving for some reason. Um, and then that ties to number three and you would suggest is, is, is the team. So you know, what is, what, who, why is this a team identified this pain point? Who have they surrounded themselves with? Do they know what they're really strong at? Do they know what they're really weak at? And do they have complementary people around them? And I would say, as we have evolved, I would say, you know, key criteria to success, if we look back, is, is really having that ability to, uh, to be a visionary, see where the world's going, and being, uh, being very focused on that North Star at all times. And that allows you to be focused, it allows you not to chase shiny things. It allows you to tell investors a very specific story. It allows your team to focus only on the things that get you to that North Star. Um, and, and so we're really looking for those uh, mission-driven, myopic leaders that know they're gonna solve the, the world and win and have, you know, they're, they'd be really excited about making money, but they're actually more excited about um, sol solving this specific issue. Great, I'm glad you didn't say uh, business plans because I'm a big advocate of, if anything, contingency plans, but I think there people spend too much of an effort on that and too little on being passionate about what they're doing, so. The, the, only, yeah. the only thing that I would, so I, I, you know, we say that a business model you know, generally changes every three months in early stage investing. Um, so a five-year plan, you know, just is, is worth nothing. I think one thing that is important though, is under really understanding your, your metrics, um, whether, whether you're a, a B2B business or B2C business, even if they're not great, understanding the levers you need to 
work on to scale and improve those over time, the ability to demonstrate that progress will give the investors confidence. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, a question I had is a little bit about um, where, where your resources come from. So we know uh, venture capital is typically funded by institutional investors. And as this environment changes, it sounds like you may be changing, you as a, as a VC team may be changing, and others might be as well. And there might also be some demands based on the institutional investors' preferences with the outcome of COVID. And I wonder if you could speak a little to how that's impacted the demand for what you do, and also if you're in fact changing in any way what you do in order to meet uh, those new requirements. So uh, there's a couple things there. So the first thing I'd say, going back to the last crisis, um, majority of VC assets were actually funded through high, high net worth individuals, family offices, uh, and, 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 and similar like folks. Institutions really started uh, ascribing a specific allocation to VC really only in the last kind of five years and it's been growing over time. Um, so I think so I think we're positioned a little bit differently um, because we're a specific allocation, and so w when they do their asset allocation at their level, they have a bucket um, uh, of capital that they're going to deploy in our direction, which which is great because they're the deepest pool of capital. The other thing is, and this um, I always like to emphasize, this is purely speculation because I don't know yet because we just finished our fundraise. Um, we, we won't be fundraising f for a, another year or so. Um, but, you know, ostensibly what we've heard to date is, you know, back to my prior point that PEs perform so miserably that, um, you know, some institutions are seeing growth in VC um, asset allocations going up because they see that they're actually going to be the ones at the forefront of the opportunities post-crisis, not, uh, you know, the P guys that are, you know, typically invested in legacy businesses. So um, do you see, by the way, fundamentally the institutional, the appetite on the part of institutional investors now increasing or decreasing? My, my expectation is, is, is that it's, it's, it's going to be the same or increase. Um, so, uh, let's see, but sorry, but, but and I would I'd also suggest that individuals, uh, family office, and most importantly, I believe corporates are probably going to participate less. Um, and that's because their individual balance sheets, um, have been hurt or in, in the corporate world, they're deploying their capital to their core business. And, you know, it's been an amazing um, uptick in corporate participation in VC deals in the last five years. In 2019, I think it hit 35%. And, you know, typically we see corporates as the weakest hands uh, in, in capital tables. And so, you know, I think that's probably where the most risk is for, for VCs if they've depended on, on, on corporate investment. So do you see less uh, corporate spinoffs and, uh, you know, the, the kind of environment of corporations giving uh, new firms an opportunity to, to kind of grow in their own space? Look, spinoffs could increase because they need to, to, to find li liquidity. I think what is going to decrease is the investments in labs, uh, innovation centers, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm you know, investing in, in other VC funds, uh, investing directly in, in young startup companies. I think they're going to be distracted and focusing their capital on, on their, on the core business, which for us is a great thing. Um, we, we, we don't particularly need their noise. Um, and, and you, you, you know, it, it, it just reduces competition. Great. So let's move a little bit to stakeholders. Um, we can think of stakeholders as uh, the government, as uh, us, as uh, 
uh, consumers and even DeGroote as a business school. So what do you think stakeholders can do to help industry as a whole? And do you feel that, for example, the government is reacting uh, in an appropriate way? And are the stakeholders doing enough to support uh, the business environment during this pandemic? Mm. So it's a good question. And, um, you know, I think it's very difficult to criticize um, in, in, in the midst of a crisis. So I think it's more, you know, we meet, need to make sure that we have a point of reflection in a few months on what we could have done better. I would say that one area of policy that we've spent a lot of time on and we've discussed it at other McMaster events is the importance of open banking specifically um, and empowering consumers and small businesses to be able to access their data. Um, had that been in place, you know, we would have been able to deliver relief or loans in a much more efficient way. Um, so I think that that should be a point of reflection. Um, certainly the UK and Europe and Australia um, have benefited for ha by having that infrastructure in place. And it's, it, it's an area that we'll continue to, to advocate for. The second thing is with every, you know, with the digitization of everything getting compressed from you know, something that people thought would take five years to two months, um, we're seeing a huge, huge increase in cybersecurity threat. And, and, and so you know, we need to make huge investments uh, across the board to protect consumers' data um, and key infrastructure as, as we kind of enter this, this new wave of digitization. So my last question to you before we go to the audience questions is uh, regarding the glass half full opportunity piece. Uh, can you tell us, you know, besides we're, we're all hearing negative news every day, um, you know, reading the news is a, almost a depressing uh, habit we're all forming, but there must be bright news and you must be seeing some opportunities and some uh, wins in the environment. Could you share with us some of the, some of the positive outcomes that you've observed? Sure. Uh, and, you know, I would say we feel very fortunate. I don't, I don't think we could be in a more exciting place or, or have a more exciting perch because um, majority of what we see is positive. Um, you know, the direct-to-consumer businesses, for the most part, are fl flourishing across the globe. Um, and it's because, uh, you know, the, in, there's inertia to try their services, there's an opportunity and a reason to try their services that there may not have been before. Um, and then the other thing that, that is as important is the cost of acquisition is just plummeted. So with incumbents in retreat mode, trying to, to reduce costs, trying to figure out what their near-term priorities should be, um, we, we've seen the ability to acquire customers um, be much more successful and at, at a, th you know, in some circumstances at a third of the cost that it used to. So I think um, our biggest challenge is temporary in our enthusiasm. And again, staying in data observa observation mode to really understand what the, the post quarantine world looks like. But I would say generally we're tempted to be more aggressive uh, invest more capital to cement or cement a leadership position amongst our, our digital peers, but uh, you know, long term, really go after market share of the incumbents. Um, and and there, so, anything direct to consumer, you know, we're seeing that in insurance, we're seeing that in banking, we're seeing that in uh, our wealth management business, uh, Well Simple, our banking business, Coho here in Canada is up 60% post crisis. Um, our telemedicine business dialogues up a hundred percent post crisis. Uh, so there's there's a lot of amazing stories that are emerging out of out of this, and I, I think it's just going to accelerate the the J curve for a lot of these businesses beyond everyone's expectations. That's really great to hear. That's really good news. So uh, so happy to hear that. So now we're, we've got audience questions. One's a very very simple question which is, uh, 
is capitalism still the right system today? <laughs> a nice, easy question we're throwing at you. Right. I have to believe it is. Um, you, you know, I just think that uh, capitalism drives uh, the motivation to ideate and the motivation to to go after and pursue a dream, a solution, you know, a service, um, and be rewarded for it. And I think that's, it, that's, that's really exciting as, as an individual. And I think it, it, it spawns and inspires other people to do the same. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the least of the worst models. Um, and I think it continues to be, I think there's lots of political debate and rightfully whether, you know, we should have some base guaranteed income. Um, but I probably should leave it to Len and the other professors to opine on that. Okay. Well, we'll tackle inequality a bit later. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the next talk. So we've got an interesting question from someone that's very relevant to you. It goes like this. Does this pandemic change the way startups pitch themselves to VCs. I'm sure there's going to be, already has been a change in the way VCs are being approached by startups. The in-person meeting with a potential startup has an advantage over virtual meetings. So even if the product service isn't that great, if the founders are of good character, then maybe we could compensate for the product. And this person thinks it might be difficult to bring out someone's character in a virtual setup due to the limitations of you know, that kind of uh, media. So what do, you, what do you think about the sort of the opportunity to pitch today to VCs? It's a really good question and something we're struggling with. Um, we, um, we have done uh, two deals post COVID. We are about to do two more all of those deals, we knew the people beforehand um, in, in, in some way. We have yet to grapple with, would we ever be comfortable funding a company whom we've never met? And I think my bias is possibly, but we would, we would require other things to, to, to get that comfort. We would you know, probably want to know the investors that are already involved in the company. We would probably do, you know, a much deeper dive into uh, due diligence. Um, and then the last just practical thing we're doing, because we're a global fund, we're making sure we've got people in all of our core countries on the ground so that you, when domestic uh, meetings is possible, we have people that, that can meet with founders directly but it but uh, you know that's a that that's the COVID reality the 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 real question about pitching VCs look I I go back to that most VCs are thesis driven and I think you, you, most are producing enough content to be pretty familiar with their thesis so you know build your business based on the pain, the pain point you're trying to solve. And then when you're thinking about raising capital, map it to those that have specific interests in the vertical or the solution that, that, that you're, you're pursuing. Look at their portfolio companies and talk about synergies that they may, may have um, and, and customize and refine who you're targeting. Otherwise you're going to, you're going to waste a lot of time in yeah, unnecessarily. Very good. So uh, um, I take it you get a lot more proposals than you than you support. What would the ratio be? Would it be like a hundred to one, two hundred to one, fifty to one? So we we will review uh, a, a thousand companies this year, and we'll most likely make ten to fifteen investments. Right. Good. Okay. That might be close to the odds of getting hit by lightning. So look out when you go out outside in the There's store. There's a lot of us. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So uh, another good, interesting question we have here is one of the biggest concerns regarding fintech is about security. 
Although this person believes that many firms specializing in security already, how could we improve a secu uh, the secure transactions and gain people's trust? Is quantum computing the ultima uh, ulta ultimatum for cyber security on FinTech? And since technology cycle is getting shorter and shorter, the budget for investment on FinTech would get bigger and bigger in the future. So how can we minimize that? Any advice on that? That's a long FinTech question. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big so first one, trust is everything. Um, if we don't have trust, quite, I mean, in simple terms, the cost of acquisition is too great because um, you know we'll find those few that you, disciples, if you will, but there just won't be enough people that trust us um, to 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 make it worthwhile and scalable. So a key component of trust is people feeling secure, um, and this this would play into the need for uh, and this is a Canadian comment the need for us to build secure infrastructure. Uh, in this country, we're so far behind uh, relative to other countries. That includes, you know, API information rails, uh, like data infrastructure. So one thing that uh, happens today is something called screen scraping, where people are sharing credentials of their bank accounts um, to be able to, you know, provide, you know, a, a personal balance sheet consolidation, which is a great service, but. Canadians are currently forced to do that through something that is much less secure. We should be building open API infrastructures um, that have secure requirements within them and use certain standards uh, to, 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 to mitigate that risk. Um, the second thing in, is, is, you know, all of our companies have to make huge investments in, in, in cyber. Um, we, I would argue, can hire some of the best talent because they're exciting places to work. Um, and so I don't think it's a talent gap. It, it's just ensuring at the board level that, that that's a huge priority. Um, fortunately, if you look at most of the cyber attacks, they're actually against incumbents for two reasons. One, they've got more, it's more exciting to, to, hack into their customer base because it's larger, but two, it's because their infrastructure is so old, uh, despite the investments they've made. And you know, we get to build completely new infrastructure um, every time we start a company. And then the last piece I would say, most platforms like ourselves, um, we have dedicated cyber, uh, cyber teams. So we just brought on a C CSO from our platform um, that used to, to work for critical infrastructure for the Canadian government. Um, increasingly, you're going to need these types of resources on your team. And you're going to have to accept, sadly, that there's going to be data breaches um, all the time. So it's the question of how you act, how you contain it, what are your protocols, how do you inform your customers uh, that will ultimately create that confidence. Thank you for that. So this is a personal question. Um, one of our audience is interested in what made you personally move into venture capital versus other forms of private equity. You know, why did you go into real estate or into credit or into infrastructure development? Why did you decide to become a VC? So I, uh, mostly because of personal interest. Um, so I, I was an entrepreneur, so I started uh, Horizons Exchange Trade Funds and even while I was doing that, I, I was beginning to invest in emerging Canadian young companies that I thought were exciting and interesting and helped mentor some of those early c CEOs and really uh, enjoyed that. And uh, so when I exited my business, I kind of accelerated my interest in, in that type of activity, which then led me to, to building Portage. Sounds great. So as you built a portage, one of one of our audience wants to know, how do you differentiate yourself uh, in terms of uh, other Canadian peers? So that's, that is a really important question that we always have to think about on a regular basis. So one, I mentioned this earlier, we're dedicated to financial services. So we're not trying to do everything. We're trying to be uh, experts on uh, a, a smaller vertical 
being banking insurance and wealth management. Um, two, we're global. I think you know most VCs um, you know stay local. We believe that uh, having global insights and global experiences makes us better investors, allows us to see a little bit around a corner uh, in one market versus the other. Um, and it also builds a global ecosystem. And, and this goes to sort of the globalization of workforce. You know, our, our ability to connect people around the world, uh, find an expert in San Francisco that, that can help a company in Germany um, for us has been very differentiating. And then the last piece I would say is we've made um, outside of some very large growth funds, not VC funds, um, we've made huge investment in vertical experts, uh, which help us in due diligence in companies, but more importantly, it helps our companies kind of move forward and, and having access to talent that they wouldn't other, otherwise. So I mentioned our head of security, we also have a CTO on staff. We have a head of growth on staff. We have a leadership coach on staff. We have a head of enterprise sales on staff. And all of these people spend all of their day trying to help and scale uh, our, 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 our younger businesses. And then the last piece is we have a team that sole uh, objective is to find commercial partnerships for our portfolio companies. Um, and I think to date we're now close to 60 uh, commercial agreements that we've achieved between uh, our portfolio companies and our general ecosystem, whether they're investors or just friends of our platform. And that that generates real value and, and we've been able to prove that over and over. So that uh, actually leads to our last question. We only have time for about one more. But given that you have a global emphasis, which is wonderful to hear, from, from my academic perspective, can you share with us how you build digital relationships, given that these are people all over the world that you're actually bringing into your, your organization? How do you do that digitally? Well, I, I, I used to spend two weeks a month on a plane, um, and, and so did uh, many of us. And so we were you know, it was, it was a lot of shoe leather and, and I don't think that's ever going to go away. I believe fundamentally that personal connections will always be uh, best cemented or, or the foundation of a great relationship will, will happen um, in, you know, a, a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. So I look forward to being able to do that again. But I, I do th think w w this experience has shown that we can continue great relationships and we can make more meaningful relationships through digital means. But I think you have to find, uh, you, you need to use these digital means in, in different ways. There's sometimes to have formal meetings and presentations, um, but it's really important to have a call about, you know, something completely unrelated and, you know, talk about families. Um, you know, to, there's one example recently, I spent an hour talking about heli skiing, which is, which is one of my passions, but finding another way to, to, uh, build a personal relationship outside of that specific need or, or business case, I think is, is going to be more important. Adam, uh, I can't thank you enough for really, really fascinating interview. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and share some of your insight with our audience. Um, we're about out of time, and I think uh, I'm going to pass the baton over to uh, Dean Waverman. Len is going to take it from here and hopefully pass along some inter interesting information on, on my tax as well as some um, appreciation. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, gentlemen. You can see uh, I began by saying that I really rely on Adam for advice, and you can see that what he is completely honest, uh, mm -hmm. giving you the best that he knows. He's not mincing words, and he's not saying, well, this is for private consumption. So, mm -hmm. And Benson's the same. You can see we have professors like Benson uh, who are equally, uh, in their sphere, equally uh, wonderful. So uh, thank you both. It's been really, I learned a lot uh, from this uh, session, not just about FinTech and COVID, but uh, you know, about the VC market generally. So I want to share another up, uh, update that uh, Benson mentioned briefly. 
So my tax is a 20 year old nonprofit research and training program across Canada. And we're pleased to announce something called the BSI program, the Business Strategy Internship Program, uh, which will begin at the beginning of June, which is designed to help SMEs. A SME in the MyTex definition is someone, is a firm that has 500 or fewer employees. And so uh, what this means is that you could get a DeGroot student, uh, an upper level undergrad or an MBA student, uh, for uh, up to four months between June 1st and December 31st. Uh, and 75% uh, of the cost of that student are covered by Matt, my tax and the booth. So uh, for a very small investment, you'll get, a, a, as I said, a, a someone who's been trained by people like Benson and listen to people like Adam uh, in your organization helping you out. And uh, this is really to, we understand and why we've partnered with business, with Burlington Chamber and Hamilton Chamber, we understand what's going out there. Disruption has affected us. You know, we thought we were unlike the music industry. It would happen to them, but <laughs> not to education in, in, in three weeks. So uh, there we go. Uh, and so this is really to undertake a strategic analysis and help restore or modify business operations for us. Need. So I think there's a slide coming up which shows you what that is. And that program, uh, as I said, we have 55 of those kinds of positions at the group. So if you're a firm or needing that, wanting that kind of assistance, just come, uh, go to, go to uh, ask uh, the expert or, or email uh, someone who will put a sign up as to what, how you uh, attract that. So also, uh, if you hope you all enjoyed today's webinar, we'll be sending you notices about the upcoming ones. We try to do a number, I have one tonight with Kelsey Gunderson, who's the head of security at the Rention Bank. So uh, we're, we're really trying to uh, continue going. And uh, here, we, there's the ask. So if you go to ask an expert, it'll take you also into the MyTax site so you can uh, get, a, get something. So thanks everybody for attending and uh, have a great day, enjoy yourselves. <laughs>